Welcome. Welcome to our combination of churches as we celebrate. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Welcome. And um, as we celebrate our two, our two church groupings together, we gather together. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing, a wonderful, wonderful time. And it's a time when really as many of us as are here throughout the world, we have people from every, every denomination who are celebrating, celebrating Easter Sunday in just in our country and other countries throughout the world. We are part of one of the most powerful Christian groups you can possibly imagine. And that's what we're doing. And I just want to, before I close, I just want to, I just want to make reference to a passage here. If you remember, if you recall, Jesus had a terribly rough, rough time. From the time he was first came out and he was there in the desert for 40, 40, 40 days. And in the end, of course, when he was on the cross, and today we celebrate that he was risen. And in Hebrews, <clears throat> there's a passage that I just want to share with you. It's just so powerful. It says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. In other words, reading that, I would say that if Jesus had to do it again, he would. That's our Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Good morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. Can we give Jesus some praise? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You're so good. Can we stand if you're able to worship this morning? Thank you, Lord.
Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. Amen. I'm going to say he is risen, and you're going to say he is risen risen indeed. He is risen. We could do better. He is risen. Amen. Amen. Before I bring the children up, bless them. And if they'd like, some of them can go downstairs for Sunday school. Um, Two nights ago, I had a wild dream. (laughs) And um, yeah, it was, it just, just hit me. Wasn't looking for it. I dreamed about all the ministry that was happening in this building. I, I, I saw some of the First Baptist folks serving kids in rooms full of kids from the neighborhood. It just blessed me. And I really did. Um, it, like, it, it really shook me, you know, having this dream. And um, as both of our congregations know, we voted and we're, 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 we're moving towards like kind of merging together and continuing the gospel ministry on this corner. I, I, just, I just want you to know um, we want to carry on that legacy until Jesus comes again. Amen. And if it isn't us, it'll be somebody else. But we want to see God's good news preached, people loved in his name in this space for years and years to come. I'm just really thankful that God has joined us together. And I feel like this service, in a way, though we've done a bunch of Christmas Eve services, for some reason this feels really like our first joint service. <laughs> and it's really cool. We're going to invite all the kids to come forward. We're going to bless them in the name of Jesus. And if you don't know, my name is Pastor Joe. And welcome to our combined Easter service. <laughs> all right. Awesome. <laughs> so what we, if I'm going to ask you to kind of stretch out your hand like this as we bless these kids, all right, stretch out your hand towards them, and I'm going to bless them. God, we pray for these kids. They'd grow up knowing you. They'd grow up knowing about your love. They would actually learn to run to you and not the things that will actually hurt them even more as they grow up. Spare them from some of the stuff that we maybe have gone through. Protect them, Lord. May your ministering angels be there for them when they need them most. May your eye be on them and you encourage them. And, Lord, even as some will go and and be taught, Lord, would they learn about you, learn to love you at a young age. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. We have crafts for kids up to grade one downstairs. You guys are welcome to go down there. If you're new, you want to see what it's like down there, you can go down there at this time. But right now, I'm going to invite the... the, um, I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward as we take this offering. So you're going to go on the left, and you're going to go on the right. Let me pray for this offering. Wait, Andrew, come back. Come back. (laughs) I didn't give... Clear enough instruction. My bad. Father God, we thank you, God, that everything we have comes from you. And Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would provide so that we can be generous. Lord, we pray that you would take care of all of our needs. You are Jehovah Jireh. But also you are a generous God, and we want to be like you. And so, Lord, help us to have faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we're taking this offering, we invite Rachel to come and read our first word from the Gospel of John.
Is this thing on? Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. John 20, okay. John 20, 10 to 18. 
Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body was. One was at the head, the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned around and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me. I have not yet returned to the father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord, and she told them what he had said. Please stand and be worship people this morning.
walking out of that tomb for us. Rising on a third day for us. Thank you, Jesus, for Resurrection Sunday. Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that you give us life and life abundantly, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You are so amazing, so wonderful, so worthy to be praised.
living hope, Lord. Thank you, Father. John 20, starting in verse 19, on the evening of the first day of that week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone who sins, they are forgiven. And if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here. Put your hands. See your hands. Reach out 
your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Good morning. Good morning. He is risen. Amen. All right, we got to try that again. He is risen. Amen. What do you say? He is risen indeed. Amen. All right. If this is your only Sunday that you come to church each year, you probably think Christians are a bunch of happy, clappy people because we are. This is a big day. Amen. But I don't want you to be confused by this happiness, because it's not fake. It doesn't ignore the hard realities of life. And if we were to go back to the first Easter, if you will, it wasn't quite so crystal clear to them what was going on. Because in reality, yet again, it seemed that death had won. All the hopes of Palm Sunday for a return of Israel's greatness under the rule of King Jesus lay buried in the tomb next to Christ's body. His disciples were stunned. They were disoriented. They were scared for their own lives. They were hiding, waiting for the storm to pass because they didn't want to meet the same fate as Jesus. Death was real. They felt it. They, they saw it. They experienced it. And the joy that they experienced following Jesus was now gone. It was replaced with pain, fear, and grief. The disciples witnessed Jesus cast out demons. They witnessed him heal deformed bodies and drive out sickness. They witnessed him raise the dead. But now he lay dead in a tomb. You see, Jesus was not interested in merely treating the symptoms of our problems. Like a good, good doctor, Jesus wanted to fix the heart of the problem, right? If you have an infection, if you have an abscess, you want the doctor to dig it out, right, even though it hurts. You don't want him to put a topical cream on and a Band-Aid. You want him to solve the problem so that it goes away. And what the disciples fail to understand in this whole time of confusion, disorientation, of fear, of grief, was that, that the enemy was much bigger and more powerful than all of Rome. They didn't need a king to come and drive out the Romans. They needed something much bigger and much more powerful. And while they were trying to make sense of their new reality without Jesus, Jesus was actually engaged in a battle against the enemy of their souls. Jesus was actually engaged in a battle against the enemy of their souls. Everything seemed quiet. Everything seemed mundane. Everything seemed like Jesus was just a normal human, but he wasn't, was he? He was God himself incarnate in human flesh. And he was waging a battle that couldn't be seen in our physical realm. It was being waged in a spiritual realm that we couldn't see. If you remember, going all the way back to the beginning of the story of Scripture, our enemy 
snuck into the garden, right, as a serpent. And he was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from the tree, from any tree in the garden? See, Satan's sneaky, isn't he? He's trying to trip you up. He's trying to trip us up. And he's definitely trying to trip up Eve. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the tree in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. And the serpent, continuing to manipulate, said, no, you will certainly not die. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. That seems like a good idea, doesn't it? To have the same knowledge as God, the ability to make decisions for ourselves, that seems like a really great idea. I mean, at least the serpent thought so. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was delightful to look at. And that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. In verse 7, then the eyes of both of them were opened. And they knew that they were naked. And that just means they became ashamed. They felt shame for the first time. And so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So when we talk about Satan having the power of death, we're not necessarily meaning that he outright just kills us. Right? We see in Job 2, 4 through 6, that Satan can take life only when God allows him. Instead, Satan really has the power to influence us and our lives in ways that lead us into separation from God. We see this in Ephesians 2, right? Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of of the power of the air, the Spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by, very, by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. You see, Satan carries this innate ability, this incredible ability to manipulate us, to make us believe that the things that God himself has said are not good for us, no, they're actually good for you. You should take that fruit. You should eat it. You will be wise. And in that moment, God, God did what he said he would do. He said, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. You shall surely die. Death isn't just an event in our lives, it's a path that we're on. And Paul argues for the importance of the resurrection. He says in 1 Corinthians 15.32, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Right? If we think we're going to die, we tend to say, forget it. Let's just live exactly how we want. We throw all caution to the wind. If I'm going to die, I might as well live life happy. And in this way, Satan leads us on a path into greater and greater bondage and greater and greater sorrow, and greater and greater grief. Right? Statistics show that if you've experienced trauma, you have a higher likelihood of committing suicide, of um, having serious physical health problems. 
right? Because death is a path that we're on. It's not just an event. It's something that will continue to pull our lives down further and further and further until it pulls us right into hell itself. You can understand why the disciples were so confused. Jesus had exercised power in, 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 in his earthly life over death, right? He had cast out sickness, which is an effect of, of the curse, which is an effect of death. He had, he had healed people. He had cast out demons. He had seemed to display the kind of power that would do away with death. And then here he is. He's in the tomb. This makes no sense. But this is where the story begins to get good. Satan meant all of these things to hurt you. But God uses it for your good. Amen? Genesis 3.15 Already, as soon as Adam and Eve have eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he's already got a plan in place. He says, I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, speaking to the serpent, speaking to Satan. And he says this, he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. He, in this passage, all the way back in Genesis, refers to Jesus. It was a plan in place that the cause of all of this, the death and sorrow that exists in this world would be put to death by Jesus himself. But it required something of him, didn't it? It required that he died himself. It required that he go down into the tomb. If he, Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 say this. Jesus also shared in these so that through his death he might destroy the one holding the power of death. Who is that? The enemy of your soul, Satan himself. Verse 15, and free those who were held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. You know, we say he is risen, right? He is risen indeed. But because he's risen, we can also say we are free. We are free indeed. Amen? Amen? Can you say that with me? We are free. Free indeed. indeed. All right, we got to do better than that. I'll say, we are free. You'll say, free indeed. We are free. Free indeed. Yeah, we've been set free. We're no longer slaves to sin. We're no longer slaves to death. We're no longer slaves to addiction. We're no longer slaves to our anxiety. We're no longer slaves to anything that the, the devil has designed to bring you down. And that is why on this Sunday, every year, you would believe, you would think, the Christians are the happiest people in the whole world. Amen. We got something to cheer about now. We got something to fight with. We are not stuck in our sin. We are not stuck in desperation. We have life. We have hope. We have joy. You may ask, well, Chris, death is still here. And, and you know what? You're right. But there's a promise. There's a promise that, that Jesus is going to ascend to the throne of God and God's going to make his enemies a footstool for his feet. Like Satan still gets to play around, doesn't he? We see it and experience it in our own lives. Ladies and gentlemen, don't let that fool you, though. He's lost the power already. He no longer holds the power of death because Jesus 
conquered it when he rose from the dead. The reality is that one day we're going to be in heaven and there will be no more fear and there will be no more death and there will be no more tears. There will be no more loss. And so we live our lives now in the hope of the resurrection, in the power of the resurrection. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's give some praise to Jesus. All right, if you all could stand and sing with the choir. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to the conclusion of this powerful service this morning, we are so blessed to have so many folks here. We are so blessed to have the leaders of all, this, of all these folks here. It is just so wonderful to be able to get together on this day. If we could do it, we would do it every, every day of the year, Lord. It's just so fantastic. It's just so brilliant. It's just so wonderful. And it's so loving, and it's so fabulous. 
And so, Lord, it is as we go home today, as we go to our homes and we gather up our, our time together, we will always have this church here. We believe that. And we will always have this going on. And we will also, all these folks here, will always be turning to you and, and, to, and to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit whenever we need help and whenever we need problems and we want to help other people as well. And we thank you for all these things, Lord, and we thank you for the, the power and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the imag and the, all the imagination which came into this service and all, the, and all the ideas and all the projects and everything that came into this service today. We are so blessed, and we thank you, Lord, because you're behind everything. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.